Take a Bible. The basis for everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we believe is the Word of God. It is the foundation of our life. It is the foundation of this universe. Those who would deny that. I have a guy that calls our ministry. He suffers from several emotional, psychological related issues. But he loves the Lord. And he tells me all the time, he said, Pastor, you're about the smartest man I've ever heard. Well, I appreciate that. He said, I don't know near as much as you do. And I said, listen, do you believe that God created the universe in six days? He said, yeah. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he is God's only begotten son? He said, yeah. I said, do you believe in a hell for those who sin and a heaven for those who God has made righteous? He said, yeah. I said, you're the smartest man in the world. You believe those things? You have wisdom? that far exceeds the smartest smart person at Harvard University. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 6, turn there, Romans 6 and Romans 5. Let me give you the basis of what it is that I'm going to be, what God has laid on my heart. I mentioned a few Sundays ago that God was sort of leading me to preach on death and with all the riots, the looting, the communist takeover attempts of our nation and people mark my words communism has never let Christianity thrive however when you read the book of Acts you understand that Christianity does best in days of persecution it does. Study the book of Acts. They persecuted them. God moved them out and everywhere they went, they went preaching the gospel. And the same thing, I believe, can happen in our time. But it seemed like every sermon I was going to preach, I'd think about death and think about what it means and how, what it means to a sinner, what it means to a saint. And God lead me in a different direction. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to preach on death today. And, and it didn't didn't come out the way I had thought it out in my mind. So I just said, I'm going to follow the Lord on this. You can title this, How to Recognize Death. Now, you may think that's easy. However, I want you to think of things that can die. Pets die, animals die. People die. Relationships can die. A marriage. There can be death in a marriage. Churches can be dead. Amen? Hopefully, never this one. Hopefully. That's up, really up to two people. God and us. Amen? It's up to God primarily. It is up to us to ask God to give us life in our church. And I say it like this, a church that's alive isn't the one that's dancing on top of the pews. You can be dead as a doorknob and dance. A church that is alive is a church that still stands. You know what I mean? It still stands. Churches can be dead. A nation can be dead. Full of dead men's bones, Jesus said in Matthew 23. So I want us to think about that. Your relationship with friends, family, or... You individually could be spiritually dead. You could be dead to your relationship with God. God is not your God. He's not your Savior. He's not your Father. 
And as far as that's concerned, that relationship is cut off and it's dead. So the Bible's going to tell us, number one, the leading cause of death. What is the leading cause of death? Does anybody know? Sin. In fact, according to the Bible, sin is the only cause of death. Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. Read this out loud with me. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. Romans 5.12. Read this with me. Wherefore. I'll let you get there. Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. You believe the Bible this morning, say amen. amen. Father, I, Lord, I do not know how to preach this message. I believe you gave it to me. The scriptures are there. I don't have any ability this morning, God, to present it to these people. So as I read this morning, would you as our neighbor, would you rise up and give us bread? These people are traveling on a long journey through life. And they've stopped here this morning for comfort, for rest, and for food, for their soul, for their very life. We have seen the devastation in Kenya. And the people, many people have already died of starvation. And Father, we were blessed to find a few that we would try to save before they died. Because no one else seemed to care. Father, I love the people of Kenya. They're good people. But Father, I pray, dear God, as they listen to my voice this morning, that you would move and stir in their hearts, that they would help their neighbor. Find out who's got food and who doesn't. Give to those, Father, that don't have anything. God, that you would move the people of Kenya to take care of their neighbors, their brethren. Even, Father, if they give all that they have to somebody else, God, I know you well enough to know you'll supply it back. That's just how good you are. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the lady who gives you praise this morning. For the life that she has. I pray, dear God, that you would give her long life, many years. And she, Father, would return the blessing, not to us, but to her neighbors. Father, open up your hand and feed your people this morning, such as they have need. Meet them where they are. Comfort them, bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to say something about... Uh, some people that are sitting in this room. Okay. You've. Back when the uh, COVID scare hit everybody. And we followed our good governor's advice. I believe our governor is a good man. And he asked us to ask folks to sit at home and maybe churches could stream. Well, we we're already doing that, so that was no hard thing for us. But being out of church has, it takes its toll on you, doesn't it? We got a family here that driving all the way down from O'Fallon. If you don't know where that is, look it up and drive there. Go to their house. I'm sure they'll feed you well. They came down last Sunday afternoon just to see where the place was. And it just so happened we had just started church. And they come walking in. Hey, join us. But they said they had been, if you don't mind, they had been part of a conservative church, King James Bible Church, that folded. Just not enough people there to support it. And that happens. 
Uh, if I remember right, Brian, Pam, same thing. You had a church out there and people just didn't come anymore. It's hard to, it's hard to get. I, I'll tell you, that, I'll be honest with you. If it hadn't been for our online people, I'm not sure we'd have done so well. Because we're not moving away from this book. Amen. We're going to be stubborn. Amen. We're not going to move away from this book. And this is where the food is. If you go someplace else, you're going to get a big fat bowl of Rice Krispies. A bowl of air is what you're going to end up with. So they decided uh, their blessing that's uh, Ken and Michelle, Ken and Michelle, Ken and Michelle, Ken and Michelle. I got to say that over and over. Uh, from O'Fallon, the good O'Fallon on the Missouri side, not the blue O'Fallon, the red one. But anyway, so we appreciate them coming down. But they said, we got to get in church. We have to we have to be with some people. So it probably took its toll on a lot of you folks. You just didn't make it too well known. Some of you might know this. I don't know that you do, but I've asked them and they're fine with this. Brian called me a little over a month ago. Said that him and Pam, their past had come back, reared its ugly head. They came from years of drug abuse. And he said, we both relapsed. He said, being out of church three Sundays did us no good. And I want to tell you the kind of honor in a man when he'll face, number one, his own mistakes. When he look himself in the mirror and says to himself, you're the one that's at fault. It's not anybody else. It's you. And then to not try to hide that the way most do. To call their pastor. Say, Pastor, Pam and I, we're going to go check in. Going into rehab. And he said, the kids will be taken care of. But he said, this is what we have to do. Will you pray for us? And I told him then on the phone, I said, I'm as proud of you as I've ever been of any man that I've ever met. And um, we did a Bible study Thursday night. They gave their testimony. You can hear it online. But... I appreciate these two for facing up to their own mistakes, admitting it. I don't even have to tell you this. I don't have to tell you. It's been forgiven. And see, they just joined the church. I want you to think about that for a minute. The devil said, I'll beat you to death for that. And God said, yeah, but I'll heal it. And I'll make it better than it ever was before. Give them a hand this morning. You see, what that does is there may be somebody sitting here, similar issue, or somebody on the other side of that camera, similar issue. And by their ability and the blessing of them standing and saying, this is what I did, I'm not proud of it, but I'm wanting help, and God is my help. Somebody out there is going to seek help. I believe it. Amen. Yeah, come on. Now, see, what they saw was death. Death. Ephesians 2, verse 1. You hath he quickened. That word means be made alive. You've been brought back to life. You were dead already. How? You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That is the third witness now that we've seen out of our Bible. That tells us that death, the cause of death, is sin. Nothing else but sin. By one man sinning into the world and death by sin... God warned Adam, told him explicitly, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And God wasn't kidding. And death is brought... Now, I'll tell you what. Death is something I hate it more than anything in this world. I hate death. 
I hated losing my grandparents. Hated losing my daddy. Hated losing my granddaughter. Hated losing people out of this church that I've known for years and loved them for years and had to bury them. I hate that. But it's all because of sin. Now I want you to start thinking now in your mind. What's Examine yourself. Use these verses to examine yourself. How's your relationship with God? Is it dead? Is it alive? Is it on life support? How's your relationship with your spouse? Your wife? Your husband? How are things in your marriage? I think marriages need to be alive. Dead marriages end up in divorce. Or maybe worse. And what is the source of a dead marriage? What's the cause of a dead marriage? Sin. Sin. So we were all dead in trespasses and sins. We didn't know it. But we were dead. Where and in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Do not follow this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, a principality spirit, one who likes to rule over dead people. He's the God of the dead, not the God of the living. The spirit that now worketh in the children of what? Disobedience. There it is. That's a fourth witness. Among whom also we all had our conversation. This is why... I felt like I could bring their situation up to you and you not look down your nose at them because each and every one of you were just like them. Maybe. Maybe you still are. And you just haven't taken whatever it takes to face up to it. Now how long... Can somebody be dead before a doctor can raise them back alive? You know, children falling through ice into cold water. Pam's that ever happened in Wisconsin? Yeah, all the time. They walk out on that ice. They're used to that ice being firm. They walk out on that ice. They drop down in there. Nobody was able to get them out. Fortunately, God put a system in place that if something like that happens, the body immediately goes into like a little stasis thing where it preserves itself. And after several minutes, 15 minutes in some cases, they're able to bring these children back to life again. What a miracle that is. How long can somebody be dead before God can bring them back to life? How long was Lazarus in the grave? Four days. And they said, don't roll that stone away, he stinketh. How long had the army of Israel been dead in the valley of the dry bones? How long had they been there? Long enough to where there was nothing left but bones and yet God made them come back to life again. I'm telling you, we're serving the right God. If you've got a dead life or a dead marriage or dead friendship, dead relationships. I saw a man yesterday we hadn't seen in years. He left out of this church. Disagreements happen. You know what he said to me? He said, I've been watching you, Pastor, online. Don't be surprised if we don't come back. God can make things that are dead come back to life again. What's dead? Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. I asked you a while ago, what, what is the cause of a dead marriage? It's sin. But what kind of sin? All sin has to do with I take, you give. Am I right? I take, I take for me, it's me first. And you give. So a poor family, if that daddy or that mama sits there and watch their children starve while they eat what's left of the food, those children will hate that dad for the rest of their life. Am I right? What people take in life for themselves is sin and it will cause death. We are by nature the children of wrath even as others. Now turn to Job chapter 10. 
some of the signs now of what, how to recognize death. How to recognize things that are dead, situations that are dead, uh, relationships that are dead. A spirituality, a dead spirituality, a dead church. How to recognize these things. Job chapter 10 verse 17. Job was sitting there in his misery. And his friends, who might as well have been dead to him for all the good they were. They said, Thou renewest thy witness against me and increasest thine indignation upon me. Changes and war are against me. Listen, when there's death in something, there's always a battlefield in it. Always a battlefield. You fighting with God. You fighting with what you see in the scripture. You fighting over what's going on in your church or what the preacher said. Or you don't like this, or you don't like that. And there's always a war going on. You fighting your spouse all the time or fighting your children, children fighting you all the time. The changes and war are against me. Wherefore then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? Oh, that I'd given up the ghost and no eye had seen me. It would have been better for you to not even be married than to have a marriage that turned dead. It would have been better for you not to even come to church if after you've been there for a while and planted yourself in your family, all of a sudden things are dead. He said, verse 19, I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not my days few? Cease then and let me alone that I may take comfort a little. And then he said, before I go whence, I shall not return. Here's the danger. God can revive. But we know for a fact that death is usually permanent. Usually permanent. And he said, before I go whence, I shall not return even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. What's your life like right now? Are you in the light? Is there light in your life? Is there light in your marriage? See, darkness in a marriage means we're not talking. And I don't mean what's for supper kind of talk. I mean important talk. Darkness in a marriage is when one or both of the spouses are doing things in secret behind the other's back. That's darkness. And they don't want the light shining in on what they're doing, do they? That's death. So I guarantee you, you can find churches in Jefferson County where they don't have these nice little chandelier lights hanging over the sanctuary. They put the whole place in darkness. Why? Because that's what people like. A land of darkness as darkness itself and as the shadow of death without, notice this, I have it underlined, without any order. We have a word for that. Chaos. Confusion. Disorder. You know, there's an order to everything, is there not? Does somebody have to be first in line? If you're going to have a line, there's got to be somebody first. Does somebody have to be a boss at McDonald's? Somebody's got to be the boss. Do we have to have a president? You better believe we have to have a president. There has to be law and order. Think about our country. Where we know for a fact now politicians... Politicians who may earn $120,000 a year, how did they get to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars? Corruption. And what happens when something corrupts, George? Stinks. And our nation is full of death. Our legal system is full of death. Our political system is full of death. And I believe... Again, that there may be the loss of a lot of people's lives this year. What happens, the city council of Minneapolis did actually vote unanimously to disband the police department. Is that going to create order or... 
Don't ask me to go to Minneapolis. By the way, Fortune 500 companies are leaving. They won't put up with it. See how it works? Chaos in a marriage. Always misunderstandings in communication between children and parents, parent and children, husband and wife. Chaos in a church. It could be part of the service where everybody's jumping around, dancing around, swinging on the chandelier. I wouldn't try swinging on those. <laughs> or it could be that everybody's using a completely different Bible. There's no order there, is there? That's why they came. That's why they're sitting here in this room. Because of one Bible. They had a church that died. I don't know the reason. It's not from my knowledge to know. But I know why things die. Amen. With light is as darkness. By the, by the way, that, here's what they do. It's, and I put this down. It's noted by war. Darkness. Chaos. And Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for better. He said, Woe unto them. You know why? It's dead. Anybody who says they like the smell of a dead body, I don't care what it is, you're crazy. Something flipped in your mind and you ain't right. Psalm 78 verse 50. Look at this. This Bible's right. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. Shorten that word and you have pest. Varmints, critters running all through. What happens when people leave a house and that house stays unoccupied for years? What moves in? Critters. Pests. Place ain't fit to live in after a while. Things take over. Pestilences. Diseases. What is it when... People live around and dead bodies are laying everywhere. Is that a clean environment? Can you expect people to have a healthy life in that kind of environment? Absolutely not! It brings disease and it breeds disease. And disease, by the way, see this is where it gets important now. Because if you, and let's, say in a, let's say you're in a marriage. And the wife, she's dead spiritually. She's doing things that dead people do. She's out in sin. Which means that she's not loving her husband, not giving to her husband, not uh, being a blessing to her husband. So she's dead. What happens to him? He's going to die too. It spreads, doesn't it? Those of you who have been through divorce, you know this. It spreads. Doesn't just affect one, it reaches out and it just starts taking over. Psalm 6, this is what's going to make you mad. Turn to Psalm 6. Whew. This is an American, by the way. The t shirt that he wears on the left says, if Jesus returns, kill him again. See, he goes to places where they're doing protests, whether it's sodomites or whether it's BLM or an Antifa or whatever it is, any kind of left-wing cause, he shows up there with big signs saying, if Jesus returns, kill him again. And he's got a website. I went to his website. And then... On the right, I had to cover it up. Psalm 6, 5. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? This man's alive. Earns a livable income. 
probably does halfway well, breathes air, is able to enjoy all the pleasures of his flesh, and he hates the God that gave him that. Hates him. If you were to ask him, do you believe in God? He would say no, but I think that's a lie. He does believe in God. He hates him. He hates him. And he's not, listen to me, he's not thankful. What will kill, what will kill a relationship? Being unthankful. Somebody always giving to you and you never say a word about it. And they give and they give and they give and you just take it. That'll kill any relationship. That'll kill a marriage. It'll kill a church. And it's killing our nation. We set aside a whole day in November called what? Thanksgiving. What do you think that day is? It's a religious holiday. Whether Pelosi likes it or not. It's a religious holiday. Where we are to get on our knees like our forefathers did and say, God, thank you for feeding us. Thank you for making us a great nation. I went to his website. Did I put it up on? There it is. Here's his objectives. To advocate the widespread acceptance of the story of Jesus Christ as written in the Bible. To advocate against the widespread acceptance. To advocate prescinding the infiltration of biblical conscience into law and the courts. To reveal and expose the absurdity, the absurdity of the supernatural claims of the scriptures. To prevent the loss of human energy being wasted through religious practice resulting from the interpretation of the text of the Holy Bible. To prevent further justification of actions causing death and destruction from those in power who abuse the widespread acceptance of the Bible as truth. To rally support of reasonable thinking people and to bring about a paradigm shift regarding the support of biblical indoctrination of children and adults. To hold the church accountable for the wrongdoings and on and on and on and on. And it's like, why has he got to be a busybody in my life? What is it hurting him? If I want to believe in Jesus, this man hates God. In Romans chapter 1 verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe this guy has gone past that line? But remember... Can God raise dead things back to life? See, I've known people like this. And one of the people I knew is in heaven now. God brought him back to life again. I'm referring to my brother-in-law. He is in heaven now. Because he was dead. And God brought him back to life. Don't give up. Psalm 13, 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Things that are asleep. Sleepy churches. Sleepy people. Sleepy marriages. A lazy, sleepy, drunken nation. 1 Thessalonians 5 links it with drunkenness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Is America full of drugs and alcohol? But God can bring people back to life, can He? Anybody. Anybody who's in this. God can bring them back to life. But they have to recognize how dead they really are. There's a cure for death if you'll recognize it. But if you ignore it, there's only eternal death. 
and eternal death is not unconscious, not knowing. The eternal death is a screaming, torture-filled wrath of God for eternity. Who wants that? Well, apparently, this guy. Psalm 18.4, the sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Are we flooded with ungodly people? What about you personally? Do you flood your mind with daily images? Of ungodly people. You know, I'm not just talking about porn. I could be talking about talk shows. Right? Ellen? I could be talking about newscasters. I could be talking about comedies. Oh, I watch it because it's funny. Do you fill your mind with ungodly people? That's death. Will they have an effect on your relationship with your Bible? Oh, definitely. Will they have a, an effect on your relationship? Will Oprah Winfrey's advice for your marriage save your marriage? She's not even married, is she? I don't think she ever married that guy. She's too good for that. Psalm twenty-two, fifteen: My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Think about that. What is essential for life? Air, water. You can go about 40, 50 days without food. You can go about three days without water. You can go about five minutes without air. Think about what those mean in the Bible. Air is the Holy Spirit. The water is the Word of God. Joshua 7, 12. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their... Watch this. They could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed from among you. And see, here's the thing. You're dead when you have absolutely no power at all to stand against your enemies. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. Pride of life. Those are your enemies. They rule over you. They tell you what to do. They tell you what you're going to do. They dictate every thought. And Do you know what it's like to be hooked on alcohol or drugs or even prescription meds? Do you know what it's like to be hooked on that? It occupies every thought that you have. You have no control over it whatsoever. And it's devastating. Uh, I can't remember why I had that in there. Oh, the dust of death, no power to stand against their enemies. So instead of telling Iran, if you even so much as buy uranium, we're going to bomb you back into the Middle Ages. We sent them $450 million cash and pallets. No power to stand against our enemies. Here's Hillary. Trump is giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Meanwhile, here, have another pallet of cash. Death to America. Thank you. Psalm 33, 19. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. What is a famine? Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Why, Ken, why'd you guys come? King James Bible. Because, 
He's not going to an NIV church, not going to a New American Standard church, not going to a message church, not going to a yoga church. They'd rather just not go than to compromise on that one issue. Now, he didn't ask me, now, do you play all the notes on the piano correctly? Because if you don't, we're not coming here. I would say to him, good luck. Your Bible is, is the food, air, water. It is everything that you need to live. And without it, you're going to die. What causes... Things in a marriage, sin, what's the source of sin? Lack of this. Lack of belief. Lack of desire for it. They have a desire for everything else. No desire for the word. Psalm 44, 19, thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. I did a study years ago, I ought to do this again, called Where Dragons Live. You remember that? And I studied dragons, devils, because I wanted to find out what, what kind of nature do they have? What, where, where do they like to live? Number one, they like to live in dark places. Where are you going to find a snake? Hiding under a rock or the grass or in a bush. Hiding somewhere. They like to live where death is. In the shadow of death. And they're killers. They are consumers and they are killers. And I can guarantee you in the absence, in the absence of Jesus Christ's presence in your life, there will be serpents. Psalm 55, 15. Look. Is that a man or a woman? Good question. That's the guy, the county commissioner in Lincoln County, Oregon, who said, everybody in this county must wear a mask when you leave your house, unless you're black. Remember the unjust scale? Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. That man's a sodomite. A tranny. His mind's messed up. His mind is warped. But they elected him to be their county boss. And what? Let me just kind of take a poll of the church. What do you think his qualifications were is the reason why they elected him? Why do you think they elected this man to that post? Why? Because he's a trainee. Do you think that he's the most efficient, best executive that the county has to offer? I doubt it. They elected him specifically because he was an emblem of their wickedness. That's why they put him as the boss. Wickedness is in their dwelling and it's among them and death will seize anybody in that condition. And by the way, you don't have to be a sodomite to be wicked. Psalm 107.10, such as sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death being bound in affliction and iron. You know what that is? Bondage that you can't break. Chains that hold on to you. Things, addictions that you can't stop. And drugs is only one of them. Should I name off a few more? Because who knows who's guilty? But you're bound in iron covered in chains and death has its grip on you and it won't let go 
Proverbs 8, 12, I, I wisdom dwell with prudence. Proverbs 8 is a wonderful chapter, by the way. And it talks about wisdom and what wisdom does. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. In verse 36, he says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that hate me love death. I have a picture of Charles Darwin up here. He's just sort of the type of all the people who are too smart to believe in God. They hate wisdom. They hate. That's why I told this guy, if you believe Christ died on the cross, you believe God created the universe in six days, you're the smartest man in the world as far as I'm concerned. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a path to choose. You want to save your soul? Choose life. Choose life. You want to save your relationships? Put life in them. Speak words of life. I know it sounds like Joyce Myers, but I'm telling you it works. Speak words of life to people, not death. Not constant criticism and tearing down and screaming and yet speak words of life to people. Speak words of life to your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children. Children, do that to your mom and dad. Dad, I love you. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for watching over me, mom. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for, thank you for mom. Mom, thank you for dragging me and my sister to Sunday school. It worked. It worked. I don't have any more than that. So I'm going to pray. I want you to bow your head for a minute. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or nothing. But I want you to have a little talk with Jesus moment. Some of you who are listening to me are sitting here. You've already had experiences in life that were dead. And, and God did bring them back to life again. I've, we have people that had dead marriages and God got in that and either blessed it or they split parted ways. God sent somebody else into their life. That was a godsend. I've seen that happen. I don't disbelieve that. I, Jesus said, I make all things new. We've at times, this church has been dead as a doorknob. Me being part of that death. And I prayed that God would put life in this church. And I believe he has. I believe he has. There are things that maintain life. Things that we do, things that we say, ways we treat people. Things that we do as Americans that will cause this nation to continue or maybe bring revival to this nation. From what I can see, this is going to be the, one of the most depressing July 4th celebrations we've ever had in, as a nation. All, it's worse than it was during Jimmy Carter. But we need life in our country again. We need to choose the ways of life.